Okay, the time is 6.30. Good evening, everybody. I'll turn my camera on real quick. Um, welcome all to the virtual Twilight tour of the Old Burying Ground. I'd like to introduce Nancy Bertrand, who will be your guide tonight. If you have any questions, please submit them in the Q&A, and she will be happy to get to them at the end of the presentation. So Nancy, if you are ready, I think we can begin. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. I'd like to welcome you too to our annual twilight tour of the old burying ground. This is a time when we're usually crunching through those brilliantly colored fallen leaves. Of course, everything's a bit different now in more ways than one. Um, the leaves haven't really turned for one thing, and I think we might all be happy not to be out in the rain sliding on the wet leaves. So we're gonna be walking virtually through our old burying ground and talking about what we see above the ground and what might lie beneath. It's about our town and the history made by those who came before. This is their story. So let's get started. This is the time of year when we start thinking about our past, about the pilgrims, the brave souls who ventured across the wide Atlantic for weeks and months in wooden boats to come here and build a new future for themselves and their families. They first landed on Plymouth Rock, as we all know, in 1620. But do we all know that it was just 18 years later in 1638 that the settlers from the town of Lynn asked for permission to venture out to the head of their bounds to explore a new settlement. And in 1639, that settlement, Lynn Village, that's what we were called then, became, began here with an inland plantation. In 1640, the settlement of Lynn, of selectmen of Lynn, exempted Lynn Village from taxes as soon as seven men and their families lived here. And in 1644, sufficient houses and settlers were here to incorporate as a town. And the town was known as Reading. The original town of Reading would eventually encompass all of what is now Reading, North Reading, and Wakefield. But its center, its heart, was here. All of the original settlements were here. And here's what it looked like. You can see the cluster of houses around the Great Pond, or Reading Pond, as they called it at the time. And see how the houses were all very much close together for safety. We usually start our regular tour, walking tour, standing right about here, or actually right in front of the church that we see here. This is, of course, the magnificent current building of the first parish congregational church. That is the lineal descendant of the very first institution of that long ago town of Reading. And it was the center of their world. It was the basis of their town, both civil and religious. The first meeting house would be established on the very edge of what was then the common. The common then went from what is now the upper common all the way down to Water Street. And the first meeting house was around the corner of our present Albion Street and Main Street, or right near what is now the East Boston Savings Bank. <laughs> so imagine the world of these settlers where the trees stretched high overhead and the forest teemed with life, with life. The streams flowed rich with fish and fowl flew overhead. Wild turkeys crowded the ground and fruits and berries literally burst from the trees. The lakes were crystal clear and clean. The skies were clear, but the winters were harsh. Wild beasts of all sorts were present. 
garrison houses were needed against possible attack by Native Americans. And death was an ever-present part of everyday life. This was the forest primeval, but life here was very hard. One of the men who first surveyed our land for Lynn was a man named John Hathorne. He had a descendant named Nathaniel, you may have heard of, who later wrote a book called The Scarlet Letter, describing that the founders of a new colony, whatever utopia of human virtue and happiness they might originally project, have invariably recognized it among the earliest practical necessities to allot a portion of the virgin soil as a cemetery. And so they did here. But that burying place was not adjacent to their meeting house as we've become ac accustomed to, but by the lake that had drawn them here. It was not to the west of the church that we see here today, but to the east. It was a hundred yards to the east or to the left. In fact, right about here. This was the first burying ground that the town knew for at least 50 years and continued for use long afterward. So how many people are buried here? It's hard to tell. The town records records 29 deaths, but the town only recorded the deaths of men and landowners. So how many women, how many children and babes in arms, how many servants and how many Native Americans, how many slaves, how many rest beneath the grass on Wakefield Common? We'll never know. Our town, our pioneer town, that's what it was, was a Puritan settlement and grave sites were marked with wooden markers, maybe um, a stone with initials on it, maybe a rough boulder, maybe by nothing at all. In 1688, the town decided to move the meeting house and here's the conjectural appearance of the, what, what, it, what it looked like. Uh, they bought land from Tom, oops, sorry. They bought land from Tom and Mary Hodgman, who um, lived in what is we now call the Hartshorn House. It stood a bit to the northeast of the current structure. And in that year, the town established a new burying ground, the second burying ground. And that's the one we're going to visit now. The initial graveyard was added to in the 18th century to completely encircle the meeting house and to lay behind it. Oh, but you're probably still wondering about what happened to that first burying ground and all those graves. Because we know that it was in active use until well into the 18th century. In fact, we know the last recorded burial there was little Joshua Gould, whose dad was a carpenter whose home was on Salem Street. He was the only son of the Gould family and he was buried in 1772, just four years old before he found a watery grave in which he drowned, it says on his gravestone, little Joshua Gould. What happened to his grave? And what made them stop using that first burying ground? Well, in some ways it had to do with money and in other ways it had to do with politics. This is a Franklin Poole painting. Franklin Poole was an American folk artist. Um, we have a lot of his paintings at the Wakefield Historical Society. He lived way th well through the, the 19th century. Uh, so he actually knew what things looked like. This is uh, the way the uh, third meeting house looked. And this was the crux of the problem that arose in the 1760s, because the first parish, that was us, uh, wanted to stop using that little uh, cylindrical meeting house and to build a new one. And they wanted help 
to pay for it. Remember, the town was a lot bigger and it included North Reading and Reading. North Reading had already split off to become second parish and wouldn't pay for this one. And Reading itself wanted to become third parish. An outrage. <laughs> the first parish resisted breaking off, them breaking off, and eventually took them to court. But Reading prevailed and eventually broke off from us. And over the years, the resentment about the town of Reading um, and on this issue grew along political sentiments. You see, as the town of Reading, we only had one representative in the general court. And although we were the largest part altogether, um, the other two parts outvoted us. And the issue all came to a head during the War of 1812. First Parish was fervently, almost rabidly Republican. Well, Democratic Republican was the name of the party then. They were very, very much in favor of Mr. Madison in the War of 1812. And the other two parishes, to put it mildly, were not. It came to a head in 1812 and we split off in 1812 to become a separate town, the town of South Reading. And we needed a new municipal building. So where did we build it? Right in the middle of that old graveyard. And here is what it looked like during the Civil War. In their defense, it was the town that owned the land. So the town could do with it what they liked. And remember, a lot of those graves weren't even marked. So what they did in the 1830s was to pick up the gravestones that were still standing and they moved them all to the extreme eastern edge of the burying ground behind the meeting house. Are they there now? Well, no, but there is no doubt in my mind that the lower common is the gravesite of hundreds of our earliest settlers underneath the soil when we stake out our deck chairs to enjoy the sun there or when we pitch a tent for an event. From time to time, people have disputed with me that the graveyard was actually on the common, but here's documentary proof. This is a, a facsimile map of that was made in 1826 showing where that old graveyard was. We look at it in relation to Pond Lane. This was um, a land dispute by um, a character that I'm very fond of, Benjamin B. Wiley, Brown Wiley, and uh, a fight that he had with Burrage Jail. And very conveniently, we have this map showing where that old graveyard is. Look where the church is in the middle of the red triangle there. And just for fun, look at where the church is in this picture of Main Street in the 1880s. But Back to the graveyard. Here we see a slide, part of the collection of from the Hartshorn House, showing the path to the graveyard in the 1920s. And you see it's, it's much the same as the floral way path is today. The picket fences were replaced in the night by the 1930s. Um, and by the 50s, of course, they were replaced by the granite bollards and the chains. And I'm told that the granite bollards actually came from the foundation of the old town hall that was torn down in the 1950s. And this was all when the floral way was established. But the town tomb is still there. And lots of people, especially kids, wonder about the town tomb because Sometimes when you look at it, you notice that one of the doors seems to be a little bit ajar, as it is right there. So what would you see if you were brave enough to approach those ancient doors, to pull on that ancient ring? If that door should open, what would you find inside? Well, actually nothing at all, because the town tomb was where they put bodies um, prior to burial. This was especially important, of course, during the winters um, when the ground was frozen. 
As we look at our old burying ground today, it's interesting to note that in 1846, when the Lakeside Cemetery was started, one of the reasons it was started was because the old burying ground was completely and totally full. And it's hard to visualize that now, isn't it? So lots and lots of those stones have gone missing. Some may just have fallen over and been covered with soil. Um, some have actually been stolen, and we'll touch on that a little while later. But we are still searching for those missing gravestones from the common. We're down here at the extreme western edge of the burying ground on our walk down the floral way. We're kind of approaching the Hartshorn House in Vets Field. Now, these are not the gravestones from the common. They were moved, but not from the common. This was the location of the town pound where they would round up animals. If, you're, if your cow was missing or your goat or your pigs, God forbid, uh, this is where they would be, be kept so that you could find them. The only grave that was down here originally was this one. This was the tomb of the Sweetser family, the illustrious Sweetser family. Members of it fought in the Revolutionary War. And if you um, may have heard the name Cornelius Sweetser, Cornelius Sweetser, a 19th century guy, uh, was born here and moved on to Maine and made an awful lot of money making shoes. But he was always loyal to his hometown. When he died, he had no children. He had a lot of money to bequeath. And he, and he gave a lot of it to a social charity in Maine. Uh, and even today, great social services are being done by the Sweetser organization in, in Saco, Maine. Um, but he also did quite a service to the town of Wakefield because he gave us a donation and a challenge. Here's the deal. He gave us $10,000 free and clear as long as it was used for a public park. And as long as it was the, the money was matched by the town. And so they took him up on that deal. And it was because of Cornelius Sweetser that we have the lower common, what we now call the lower common today. It was bought back. It was actually in private hands. And that was the work of Cornelius Sweetser. These gravestones were all moved in the 1950s. Um, and the reason they were moved was they were actually originally behind the church. When all of the soldiers and uh, sailors came back after World War II, the world had really changed. Almost every hit buddy had a car. And so the church really needed a parking lot. So the town seated the church, the land behind their building for that purpose. And they moved the gravestones from the back of the church in 1949. They actually had an architect by the name of Harlan Perkins who volunteered to do the work. Uh, Harlan Perkins was a, a big architect in town. He actually designed the homestead of Elizabeth Eaton Boyd, that if you're familiar with the West Side uh, on the corner of um, Prospect Street and Chestnut Street, he designed her house. But he also helped a lot with laying out the floral way, including putting in these beautiful sweeping semicircles of the original gravestones from behind the church. Now this time they tried very, very hard. So they said to make sure that the inhabitants of the graves were transported along with their gravestones. Were they successful? Well, let's hope so. Let's meet one of them. Here is the gravestone of Dr. John Hart, Revolutionary War Surgeon. Jo Dr. John Hart was born in Ipswich, but the minute the Revolutionary War started, he joined up. He was a surgeon and he stayed with the Continental Army from the Battle of Bunker Hill all the way to Yorktown and beyond. 
He was incredibly faithful to the army. He did a lot of good things. He was well known by General Washington. Once he got in a little trouble and was actually reprimanded by the Second Continental Congress, believe it or not, we won't go there. When he came here to this town, he was the town doctor and he was renowned for, he was a large and uh, prepossessing person riding around the town on horseback. He would wear a large frock coat with all of the instruments, doctor's instruments in his pockets. And he also became a significant landowner. Um, he also um, ran for Congress and he represented us in the general court. And he was a selectman, he was a justice of the peace. Um, he was an enormously important person, and the gravestone that his family bought for him shows that. Look, it is actually, I think it's as tall as I am, which is about five and a half feet tall. It's, it's very, very tall. It, unfortunately, it was made of marble, which does get discolored over time, and it does kind of sugar, so it gets indistinct. But we certainly... We certainly really hope that the body of Dr. John Hart accompanied his gravestone here. But we'll return to our search from those gravestones from the earliest days. They're not in the semicircle. Nope. They were actually moved earlier in the 1930s. And here they are. These are the gravestones of our first settlers. And these gravestones are superb examples of Puritan gravestone art. Our Puritan settlers on this land were a people apart. We all have ideas what Puritans were like. H.L. Mencken defined Puritanism as a haunting fear that somewhere someone might be happy. But surely it was more than that. These Puritan people were full subscribers to a religion that was all encompassing. It has been described as a stretched passion, a life of striving to meet the spiritual. One of the tenets of Puritanism was iconoclasm, which means that they detested holy art. They actually saw it as blasphemous to depict Christ the saints, the Blessed Mother, even angels, even crucifixes. Shiploads of funerary of religious art was sent from England to France during the Puritan time. Just two years before the settlement of this town, abbeys were emptied and their art was buried and destroyed. And not just in churches and abbeys, Gravestones and funerary art were also destroyed. Although death was more, burials were civil ceremonies, not religious. It was vanity to have more than your name on your gravestone. That's how it started. But then, as the Puritans lived on this land and their faith evolved and changed, customs began to change. And suddenly, there was a desire to put images on the gravestones, not holy images, but certainly graven images, the very sort that were being destroyed in England. Here's some broadsides from Elizabethan England. Emblems and symbols were important to the English people of the 16th and 17th century. The people of Shakespeare, for whom many of his metaphors, they understood on a deeply primal level. This was their culture. And as they lived here in coastal New England, these emblems began to almost erupt onto their gravestones. And where did it start? It almost started here. The first known carved gravestone in this area was in 1676 in Malden. And the second one was right here, Thomas Kendall. 
died in 1681. The gravestone was carved by a person we know as the Charlestown Carver. It was still dangerous to make a name for yourself as the carver of religious art. So the first master of the art is only known as the Charlestown Carver. And look at this gravestone, the, the, the emblem of the, the time flying away above this, the head of the skull, the, the pickaxe over the bones, the little coffins. Look at those um, imps of death, they were called there, those effigies staring back at us. They're not angels. There's something else entirely, but um, this is a magnificent gravestone, the gravestone of Thomas Kendall, one of the earliest and one of the best examples of Puritan gravestone art. Not my opinion, the opinion of scholars. Here's another view of it. And you can see that all the deep carving on it as well. Now, Thomas Kendall, just to tell you a little bit about him, he was one of the first seven people here in this town to build a, to build a house when the town was first established. His homestead was located around the location or actually exactly at the location of one Prospect Street. Um, anyway, Thomas Kendall, was a very important man. Of course, he was a select man and he was on all kinds of committees, but, um, and he was a deacon. But um, he, he also, of course, his wife, Rebecca, was the town's midwife. Okay. She discovered, she um, um, delivered a lot of babies, most of the babies in the town, and she had 10 babies herself. Uh, Thomas Kendall really wanted his name to go on in history, as you do, I guess. Um, and he, he must have been disappointed because of the 10 children um, that survived. They were all daughters. So none of him them would carry the Kendall name forward. And yet they kind of did because each one of those daughters had at least one son and his first name was Kendall. He and Rebecca had 175 grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Here's the gravestone of Thomas Parker. And it kind of gives you um, a view of what the gravestones were constructed like. Gravestones were kind of like icebergs. So you'd see one third of them above ground and two thirds below ground. If this were buried um, the way that it was meant to be, it would be a lot shorter. You can actually see very clearly where it should have been. Um, and the way these gravestones evolved, it was almost like what the totem pole was to the Alaskan Indians. So the gravestones were to the early settlers. Every family wanted to surround their, their loved one with symbols, to breathe them with symbols, to protect them in the afterlife. Here's this gravestone of Thomas Parker, another one of the foundations of the church, has those same crazy faces on it and the worlds of eternity on the sides. He had a lot of really important descendants throughout American history from Captain Nathaniel Parker, who might have fired the first shot, the shot heard around the world at Lexington and Concord, to former Vice President of the United States who accidentally shot a friend in the face, <laughs> Dick Cheney, and his daughter Liz Cheney as well. Now this one is so beautiful. I, I know it's um, an acquired taste, gravestones, but look how beautiful it is. The carving, the delicacy of the entablature of the wings um, on the winged skull. And this is the gravestone from 1679 of John Pearson. And notice the shape also. The shape of the gravestone was shaped like a portal. Uh, a portal, a doorway into a new life. Another view of those elegant eyebrows of this 
particular winged skull. And here is another magnificent stone, the gravestone of Jonathan Poole. Jonathan Poole, 1678, um, a tremendously important person uh, in the town, very, very wealthy. Um, his father or grandfather was one of the first, another one of the first seven people here. And he established a town mill. So he was a very, very important person. Um, and the land where that mill stood was later used by Cyrus Wakefield for his rattan factory. And now, of course, is Shaw's. But here's the gravestone of Jonathan Poole, a captain in King Philip's War. Notice on his gravestone the emblems of his office, the sword and the, the staff on there. Um, and uh, he died once again in 1678. Another view of Jonathan Poole. Oh, um, this gravestone, if you look at those uh, in a row there, this one is massive, as befits a man who was tremendously important. This is the gravestone of John Brown, described in the Indian deed as the worshipful John Brown. A portion of his homestead still exists on Cordes Street, and notice the size of the stone. Once again, it's like twice as wide as the um, as most of the gravestones, and significantly deep um, as well. He had, was a personality so big that he actually wore out three wives. And here's the gravestone of his second wife, Elizabeth Brown, who was herself a widow um, when she married John Brown. And notice the kind of things in common these two gravestones have. Uh, even though they were many years apart, they are so similar, it almost looks as if they were made at the same time. Notice that symbolism. See those gourds on the side? And once again, the gourds on the side of her gravestone. They kind of bear um, kind of an uncomfortable resemblance to press, but they were symbols of nourishment through faith and its teaching. William Heshey's gravestone, the beautiful, beautiful communion vines on this gravestone. Another massive, massive gravestone. And some simpler ones, Matthew Edwards, 1683. His family may not have had as much money to invest in the gravestone. So it's kind of a little bit coarse. But once again, we see those same faces and the same winged, winged skull. And this one here, 1704, even though the carving was a little bit simplistic, the, the, uh, the panels on the sides were beautifully made. So maybe this was a furniture carver who was just trying his hand at making a gravestone. And you notice on it, it says that he was uh, from Charlestown Bounds, which might make you wonder, why was he buried here if he was from Charlestown? Well, Stoneham was also called Charlestown Bounds at that time. And here, the gravestone of Nathaniel Goodwin. The carving on this, the carving of the lettering is really superb. And once again, we get these beautiful faces. The whirls on there are a symbol of eternity. And finally, we find the gravestone of little John Joshua Gould. Here he is, his gravestone from 1772 that we know was on the common. His gravestone has found its way almost to the shores of the lake beside which he lived his young life and in which he almost certainly died. The winged skulls would evolve into the faces of angels over time. This one from the 18th century, this one from the late 18th century, looking very stern. Here's a folk art angel from the gravestone of William Hobby, a minister of the church. Kind of a quizzical 
angel from the gravestone of Bridget Poole from the 1750s. But they kind of took a, a, a side voyage on the way before they became angels to become harpies. And we have a couple of these odd harpy symbols in our gravestone, uh, in our graveyard. These were uh, probably made by a Quaker carver by the name of Mumford. It was dangerous to be um, a Quaker, um, not so much in the 18th century, but um, we see several of these harpy figures through the 18th century. And this one, actually, I found this picture in a book. I've never actually seen this gravestone, which makes me think that maybe it was lost. It was the gravestone of a Jonathan Poole, not a relative, a descendant of the Jonathan Poole's gravestone that we saw before. As we walk through our graveyard, we also will pass war memorials, like this memorial to, to Aborn, a young man who died um, during the Civil War. Notice by the 1860s, gravestones were had changed quite a bit. This one is marble, very streamlined. Um, we'll see another war veteran. And this one is one of my favorites. This is the gravestone of Benjamin Brown. Look at that beautiful angel face. Benjamin Brown was the town tanner and he lived at the location where the Lucius Beebe home house is today at Beebe's Cove. Um, and he was uh, a descend one, also a descendant of one of the seven first people here in the town. Um, but Benjamin Brown was a tremendously important person. He um, served in all capacities in the town, but he was also, uh, during the Revolutionary War, he was a colonel. He, he fought at, um, or served at Ticonderoga. And we're very fortunate to have a letter or the text of, I'm sorry, a text of a letter from Benjamin Brown to his wife, a lovely, loving letter in which he describes leading three to 400 men at um, Ticonderoga, having dinner several times, he said, with um, General Gates and was, uh, and he also said he was sworn at by General Gates several times, but he was never physically harmed by him. Anyway, um, when Benjamin Brown, oh, he also in, in just lovely, loving, loving terms described um, the little general he called um, his son, um, Joseph Warren. Brown, who sadly only lived to be about two or three years old there when Benjamin Brown was talking about him. Oh, um, Benjamin Brown's um, gravestone reminds me of um, the fact that some of our gravestones actually have been taken away, not this one. This one actually was um, dislodged from the ground by that terrible storm we had last year in which some of the huge, huge trees in the old burying ground were actually uprooted and the, the roots actually popped some of the gravestones from the ground. Benjamin Brown's gravestone was one of them and we did kind of re-put it, put it back in, in its original hole and we hope that it would be um, safe there. But we actually found his footstone. I had a call from a fellow on Pleasant Street who was built taking a part of brick pat, um, barbecue. And in the barbecue, he found this funny looking granite thing. And it had writing on it. And it turned out that it was the footstone of Benjamin Brown. So we, we put it back in its original location. This was not the only time there was, there was somebody who had a gravestone in Greenwood on Green Street that would put it out in front of the house on Halloween, around Halloween. Um, another person on the West side called because they had found when they took apart a chicken coop uh, that had been turned into a garage, they found that a marble gravestone had been used as the step into uh, their chicken coop or their barn. So um, we're still finding the gravestones 
uh, but th a lot of them have been taken and I'm very much afraid that more of them are being taken all the time. Now I mentioned to you that some of our gravestones, lots of our gravestones are famous as works of art. And a lot of them are in books, including this one, curious looking uh, gravestone and it's found in Ripley's Believe It or Not. This was the gravestone of a fellow named Underwood. And the tree, the massive tree, grew all over and above the, the, um, the gravestone. So I personally have never seen the, the inscriptions on the gravestone because it was covered by the tree before I got here. But I have seen the illustration in that edition of Ripley's Believe It or Not. Yeah. Sadly, we have uh, reminders in our old burying ground of um, a sad time, um, the witchcraft hysteria of 1692. Here we have the gravestone of Josiah Nurse, who was a descendant of Rebecca Nurse, who of course was one of the victims of the witchcraft hysteria in Salem. And we all know that it was not limited to Salem or Salem Village, which actually was Danvers. Um, it was all over the North Shore. It spread like wildfire. Um, we know that there were lots and lots of examples of it in Andover, all the way up to Maine. And certainly, there were a lot of examples of it right here in the town of Wakefield. Uh, the, the very first person to be called away in Wakefield or what is then called Reading was a woman. Oh, here's another, the, here's that uh, footstone of Josiah Nurse that we found during one of our gravestone preservation days. And another little tiny footstone with initials that we believe belong to the nurse family. But continuing my witchcraft tale, the first person to be taken away was Lydia Dustin. You can see her name there. This is an actual church record from 1661. Lydia was kind of a busybody and she was kind of in everyone's face and complaining about a lot of people, especially after her husband died. And I think he died in the 1670s. Anyway, Lydia got a bad reputation. Lots of people thought she was an evil woman or a mean woman. Lots of people even called her a witch behind her back. But this took particular resonance in 1692 when it was spreading like wildfire throughout the north, um, the north shore of of Boston. Um, so Lydia was one of the first people to be taken away to be tried. Along with Lydia, two of her daughters, her granddaughter, because it was thought to run in families. And there were others as well. When Lydia had her trial, the judge actually said, if ever, there were a witch in the world, it was she. It was a terrifying time. Um, on September 5th of 1692, a new accuser came forward, a woman named Mary Swain Marshall. Now, she was an important person. She was the recently widowed sister of the Indian War Commander, Jeremiah Swain an important family in the town. Everybody knew her, everybody respected her. And two of the Reading women that she um, accused proclaimed their innocence. But one of them, Mary Taylor, confessed. Now, Mary was a 40 year old mother of five uh, who lived on Cowdery's Hill near Prospect Street right around where I'm speaking to you from, 
right now. Terry Taylor finally broke down and confessed. She sobbed and immediately the afflicted girl, girls fell at her feet in shrieks and cries. This very melodramatic um, steel engrave, plate engraving from the um, Victorian period is probably a little overwrought, but actually this is what happened. The clerk recorded that Mary Taylor had a dangerous eye that she struck folk down, which gave ground to think that she was a witch. But she did not admit guilt until after Samuel Wardwell and Ma Major Jeremiah Swain both chimed in, accusing her in involvement in the death of Wardwell's brother-in-law. So she conceded at first that she had in a passion wished bad wishes at Mary Marshall after Marshall accused her and that she had signed the devil's birch rhyme and had associated with the jailed Lydia Dustin. But she insisted that she had had nothing else to do with the devil, which was good, I guess, nor had she bewitched Wardwell's relative. This was kind of a strategic thing because in a way, if you, if you confessed and you, you had a chance of surviving, most of the people, all of the people who were hung for the offense of witchcraft um, had firmly affirmed their innocence. Lydia Dustin was acquitted in February, but she was still in prison when she died in mid-March. So she's actually one of the victims' names who are inscribed on the uh, witchcraft memorial in Salem. And here's that gravestone of Jeremiah Swain. I don't wanna give him a bad rap by talking about him in relation to the witchcraft trials. Jeremiah Swain was a, a very, very good man and a great man. He was a doctor. And he was also the man who was put in charge of uh, a, a whole contingent of New England forces during King Philip's war. Um, his gravestone is really nice and very ornate, but time has really ravaged it. It's not carved as deeply as some of the others. And uh, this one is not with the ones in the semicircle down underneath the tree there. This one is in its original location. So when you walk through the old burying ground, you can see um, a bunch of the stones kind of all higgledy-piggledy here and there with some footstones here and there. Those were usually in the original locations accompanying the bodies, which is, which of course is good. Um, among the people there uh, that you'll see or you, you'll find is the gravestone of Andrew Oliver, who claimed that he had taken part in the Boston Tea Party um, without any documentary evidence to prove that. Interestingly enough, his gravestone, um, we fixed it. We had a um, preservationist come in and we had a workshop and we had the gravestone fixed. And then a hurricane came through and a branch fell on it and it broke and we had it fixed again. And then it broke again. So we're gonna leave it the way it is, I think, um, the gravestone of Andrew Oliver. But while we can't leave our old burying ground without seeing um, the gravestone that is considered, I think by most scholars to be the penultimate example of Puritan gravestone art. And that is this one. This is the gravestone of Jonathan Pierpont, minister of the First Parish Church during the um, whole witchcraft thing in the 1690s. He was a great and a very, very, very good man, um, really renowned among all the other ministers from the different towns. Uh, his gravestone here is just magnificent. It was carved by a man named Joseph Lampson. Uh, and the Lampson family went on to 
um, carve other gravestones as well. This one is signed NL. And we think that he was kind of attributing it to Nathaniel Lamson, his son. Uh, but on it, all of the beautiful entablature and um, the, the, the layout of the symbols. Here's the face again. That's of course not what Jonathan Pierpont looked like. It looked like all the other faces, right? That we've seen on all the other gravestones. Um, but this one is more refined. And of course he's, he's acting as a minister. He's holding a book. And look at that winged skull with the gourds, the gourds there looking very stately and the imps of death right there in front of the um, hourglass. Whoops. We're back at the uh, gravestone of Jonathan Poole because I want to kind of end with the quote from um, Jonathan Poole's gravestone, the inscription. Friends sure would prove too far unkind if out of sight they leave him out of mind. Now he lies transformed to native dust in earth's cold womb as other mortals must. So strange his matchless worth entombed should lie or that his fame should in oblivion die. So I urge you and encourage you to not let all of our early settlers go into oblivion without our realizing and recognizing the lovely gravestones in our old burying ground. Take a walk through, a leisurely walk, um, and so that you can see uh, all of the inscriptions, all of the gravestones, um, and all of the history that lies in our old burying ground. And that concludes my lecture. Now, I have to ask Ryan, what do I do now? <laughs> Perhaps I stop sharing. Yeah, if you stop sharing, I think we can um, okay. let folks write into the Q&A and see if there are any questions. It does seem we've got a few. Um, so yeah. I'll, I can just ask them for you and then- Okay. So um, we have one question is what, what, what year was the burial ground fund founded? This one was laid out in 1689. Great. And that, I'm, I'm, that's so far, that's the only question we've got. So if anyone else has questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. Okay. Or maybe in the chat. Yeah, and I do apologize. Um, it seems we have got some issues in the chat here that was unnoticed, oh. so we'll be getting rid of that immediately. Okay, more gone over there. I actually have, Anne, thank you, um, said that, uh, have I thought about writing a book about the history of the graveyard? Um, and I have not, but I've written a, um, an article on the old burying ground for the 350 book. The um, book that we had for the 350th, and oops, you can't see it, it disappears. Um, anyway, there's an article in here, they have it at the library. And um, uh, someone has asked if Maria Nicoletti is in the cemetery. No. And Dennis, 1678 is the oldest stone in the old burying ground. Okay. Oh, I see the chats. 
Okay. Yeah, so if nobody else has any questions. Nope, it looks not like, uh, I don't think so. Well, thank you all. Thank you all very much. And Ryan, thank you too. Very welcome. And I understand that you are going to put this um, on WCAT? We will, yes. So we'll be putting that up for all to enjoy. It'll be available on our station as well as on YouTube uh, and um, video on demand. So feel free to check out our YouTube page if you'd like to see this again. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all.